Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. This is the 10th and last event from our webinar series, Sterile Filling 101, and today we'll discuss aseptic filling challenges for intravitreal drug products. The takeaways from today will include how to achieve tight fill volume restrictions, how to reduce drug product loss during fill finish, and other considerations for sterile filling intravitreal drug products. Our speakers will also cover a brief overview of what formulation development looks like, how long it can take, and what to expect during the process. Today from Berkshire Sterile, we have Vice President of Manufacturing, Tyler Rush, Vice President of Technical Operations, Dr. Xu Feng Sun, and President of the Sterile Division, Dr. Sean Kinney to speak. My name is Sarah, and I'll be your host for today. Very quickly, we welcome your questions during this presentation. To ask a question, select the arrow in the toolbar at the right-hand side of your screen, write in your question, and click send. Now let's get started. I'll first invite Sean to speak. Sean, can you first describe some of the challenges of filling intravitreal drug products? Hi, Sarah. Yes, I can. Intravitreal drug products are a bit unique because they're injected into the eye. One key aspect is that they typically are injected in very small doses. Most of the IVT drug products we handle fall in the range of 100 to 200 microliters per vial. These also typically need to stay within the tolerance of plus or minus 5% for fill weight, which at this small of a dose is a very tight tolerance. Even a tiny extra droplet could push the dose out of range. So the CMO that is manufacturing this medicine will need to have very tight control over their fill volumes. Intravitreal drugs also demand much lower endotoxin levels and particle levels. And finally, because the small doses make it critical to minimize drug product loss during filtration and filling. Even a small amount of product loss will result in far fewer filled units. Reducing losses in fill finish will help increase the overall number of units produced. During this webinar, we'll address each of these concerns and explore the steps and strategies required to achieve the desired outcomes. Let's start with controlling fill volumes and achieving tight tolerances at low volumes. To achieve tight control over fill volumes, the CDMO will need a high quality pump. At Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing, we offer three types of pumps. The most common being, of course, a peristaltic pump. And then also we can use piston pumps. On our low fill process, we use a time over pressure pump. Peristaltic pumps are the go-to choice for most aseptic fills because they excel at handling non-viscous solutions and they have a totally disposable fluid path. They operate by gently compressing the tube and creating a vacuum that draws the solution into the pump while also gently pushing the product out of the pump. Piston pumps, on the other hand, are typically selected when the drug product is viscous. The peristaltic pump vacuum and gentle pumping action may not be sufficient to move the solution. Piston pumps utilize a combination of vacuum and mechanical force to fill and empty the piston chamber. Similar to a peristaltic pump, but this is with a much greater mechanical force that is more effective on viscous solutions. Our third pump option is a time over pressure system. In this approach, the drug product is pressurized at a low level, typically around one PSI. An actuator then opens a valve to the fill needle. The pressure in the, in the vessel gently pushes the drug product out to the opening and through the fill needle. Precise dosing is achieved by adjusting the duration of the time of the opening of the valve, regulating the flow of the drug product. All of these pump types are effective at ensuring consistent and precise volume delivery. When you contact a CMO to fill your product, it's important to confirm the qualifications and tolerances of the pump that will be used. It's worth noting that many CMOs conduct their pump qualification tests with water which is relatively easy to dispense and often yields the most accurate results. However, if your drug product has unique physical properties, this can potentially influence the tolerance and consistency of the dispensing process. Another critical factor in achieving consistent and accurate volume dispensing is ensuring that the fill needle makes contact with the surface of the solution during the dispensing process. When the fill needle hub is above the solution during the dispensing, the surface tension of the drug product can lead to the accumulation of product at the needle. With each filled container, this accumulation can grow until it forms a droplet that becomes heavy enough to break the surface tension and fall into the container. In the case of volumes as low as those we work with for intravitreal drug products, even a tiny droplet can result in a weight check that falls outside the specified range 
leading to the rejection of several units. On the other hand, it's important to avoid submerging the needle in the solution while dispensing. This can cause the drug product to stick to the outside of the film needle, potentially leading to inconsistent weight checks for similar reasons described above. To ensure complete and consistent transfer of the fill volume without forming droplets, it's important to position the needle at the level of the solution. The surface tension of the filled unit will pull all the excess drug product away from the needle, ensuring a complete transfer, and this practice will result in more uniform volumes for each container. A few other approaches that can be made to increase accuracy and repeatability is to decrease the inner diameter of the tubing used with a peristaltic pump or decrease the ID of the piston pump. A smaller inner diameter will slow the flow of drug product, making it easier to consistently hit your target fill volume with peristaltic pumps. However, this can prolong the filling process. For very small fill volumes, the best practice is to conduct a fill study to assess whether you can consistently achieve the desired fill volume. If challenges arise, the CMO can optimize the pumping system to ensure the target volume is consistently met without significantly extending the fill time. In the case of a time over pressure pump, you can reduce the pressure to slow down the solution flow, making it more manageable to achieve accurate and consistent fill weights. Given these solutions, your CMO should be well equipped to consistently meet your target weight checks, provided they possess high quality, validated equipment to support your project. This is all I have to say about controlling fill volume, Sarah. I believe we can turn this over to Shufang now. Thank you, Sean. I will now invite Dr. Shufang's son. Uh, Shufang, can you describe some other unique challenges of manufacturing intravitreal drug products? Yes, Sarah. Intravitreal drug products come with uh, specific requirements uh, due to the unique administration site, which demand lower levels of endotoxin and particle counts compared to intravenous drug products. This will affect how we process the drug product, what the materials we select, and of course, what the limits we test for quality testing. Let's discuss endotoxin. Endotoxins fall under the category of halogens, which are substances capable of inducing fever in the body. When administered to humans, at the concentrations exceeding certain thresholds, pathogens can be harmful or even fatal. And the toxins specifically are a component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. The presence and the concentration of endotoxins in the drug product has a profound impact on the safety of the drug product and the well-being of the patient. Drug products, especially those administered into the eye, must be tested for endotoxins to ensure product safety. The eye is notably more sensitive to endotoxin than most other areas in the body. And so the endotoxin limits for ocular medicines are much more stringent. For intravenous parenteral products, the endotoxin limit is 5 endotoxin units per kilogram of body weight. For intraocular products, however, the limit is 0.2 endotoxin units per kilogram of body weight. This is a difference of 25-fold. To control endotoxin levels effectively, it is essential to maintain robust process control adhere to stringent aseptic techniques, and operate in an ultra-clean environment free of pathogens. In the toxin presence serves as a clear indicator of contamination and cannot be removed through the use of sterilizing filters. All excipients and active pharmaceutical ingredient that is used in the manufacturing process will need to meet GMP standards to ensure it has undetectable levels of endotoxin. Additionally, all equipment should be sterilized prior to use. If equipment is sterilized in an autoclave, 
then it should be rinsed beforehand. All materials that come ready to use should have a certificate of analysis that states it's in the toxin level. The filling environment also plays an important role in limiting an toxin level. There are many types of filling environment that can be used to fill drug product, as you see here. An isolator offers the greatest environmental control. Isolator establish a completely sealed environment that effectively removes operators from the filling area, and they use a sanitization cycle to provide a surface sterilization of the filling line prior to use. Hydrogen peroxide gas is most commonly used to sterilize the inside of the isolator, and this gas will destroy polygens and endotoxin. In our experience, using GMP-grade materials, properly sterilized materials, filling in isolators, and using proper aseptic technique, as we do for all stereophils, we can achieve the endotoxin levels required for intra vitro drug products without trying to be clean. However, for products where endotoxin control is crucial, we have a few additional strategies at our disposal to further reduce endotoxin levels and mitigate the risk of contamination. One option is to exclusively use new chemicals for a GMP film. Some GMP-grade ingredients are used for multiple formulations, such as common salts or buffers. Even though those materials are only opened in a grade C clean room for a brief period, each time an excipient is opened, there is a potential for contamination to enter the body. To prioritize endotoxin reduction, we may opt to use fresh bottles for each excipient, guaranteeing that the bottle we are drawing from has remained sealed until the fill, minimizing the risk of contamination. Another approach is to use a special filter to remove endotoxin. As I mentioned earlier, endotoxin cannot be removed through sterilizing filters. Because polygens are small, enough to pass through their pores. What we can do is remove the endotoxin using specialized filters or through tangential flow filtration. For example, we can recirculate over a microporous membrane filter that is positively charged. And the toxins are negatively charged and it can be removed through a desorption with a positively charged membrane. Recirculating over this membrane can reduce the endotoxin level in the drug product prior to sterile filtration. We perform a buffer exchange with drug product solution to remove the solute that uh, has endotoxin in it and replace it with a cleaner endotoxin-free buffer solution. However, this would only be helpful if the replacement solute is known to have a lower endotoxin level. For small molecule drug products, we can perform outro filtration. This process involves stereo filtration followed by filtration with a smaller pore size membrane sufficient to reduce endotoxin levels. This is only useful for small active ingredients. Since proteins and larger molecules would be filtered out in the process, there are other filtration processes we can employ if the endotoxin level needs to be reduced further. However, for most projects, endotoxin can be effectively limited through good process control and using high quality materials, chemicals, and facilities. Another major concern with intravitreal drug products are particles. 
USP 788 states that the parental solution under 100 ml must have no more than 3,000 particles exceeding 10 micrometers, and no more than 300 particles exceeding 25 micrometers in size per container. For ophthalmic solutions, as described in USP 789, those limits are no more than 50 particles exceeding 10 micrometers and no more than 5 particles exceeding 25 micrometers. Particles can appear in drug product in one of two ways. Particles can enter the drug product during filling process, or particles can form in the drug product due to aggregation or precipitation of the API or excipients. First, let's discuss particles inhering to the production process. Sterilizing filters have pore size equal to 0.22 micrometers. This is far smaller than the 10 or 25 micrometer particle size limits. So any problematic particles that enter the drug product during production must have been in or on the product contact materials after filtration, such as the filling vessel, the tubing used in filling, or the vial or syringe we are filling into. All the particles must have entered from the filling environment. The way to mitigate the risk of particles entering during filling is similar to the methods we use to mitigate endotoxin contamination. All materials used should be washed to remove particulate and sterilized prior to use. An actual clean environment should be used for filling. And a sealed environment, such as an isolator, will offer a much cleaner environment for filling. Laminar flow is crucial to keep the particle out of the air during filling. And there are aseptic techniques that must be followed to limit the risk of contamination or particulate from falling into the final containers during filling. For example, operators should never reach over open containers in the isolator or break the laminar flow above open containers. If they need to perform an action over open containers, they should use stainless steel tools to perform these. Once the containers are sealed, the product will be protected from any particulate in the environment around it. The other source of particulate is inhering to the drug product. The most common source is by aggregation of the API, causing it to precipitate out. This can happen for many reasons. The solution may require a change in the formulation design the formulation process, or the production process. If we discover that the shear forces, for example, <clears throat> is damaging the API and causing aggregation, we may opt for other methods to pump and mix the solution to limit the shear forces. If the product is precipitating out due to an interaction with a material used in the production, then we can perform a material compatibility study to determine the culprit and exchange it for a different material. If the product is still precipitating out, then this will likely be an issue that can only be fixed in formulation development. An excipient may be added or the properties of the drug product may be adjusted to help reduce aggregation of API and keep particle counts down. We discussed this a bit in our previous webinar we recorded, the ABCs of formulation development. There are many practices to reduce particles from entering drug product during the fill finish process. And while these may seem like an ordeal to implement, Nearly all our aseptic fills will meet the stricter particle requirement for ophthalmic solutions without taking any additional special care to limit or reduce particles. 
usually just keeping special care to limit the particles and in the toxin contamination through careful execution will be sufficient to reduce levels into acceptable ranges because we already use high quality equipment and materials to manufacture. After filling, the field units will undergo visual inspection. Then analytical and microbial testing will be performed. We offer on-site endotoxin testing and particle testing for all drug product lots we fill. Reducing drug product loss is another significant concern to clients, and Tyler will be covering this. Thank you, Shufang. I'll now invite Tyler to discuss how to reduce drug product loss in fill finish. Thanks, Sarah. Drug product loss is significant concern for many sponsors, especially those dealing with limited quantities of product they're formulating. In projects like interocular drug products, even a loss of one mill of solution can equate to 10 unfilled vials if the target volume is 100 microliters. By enhancing the total recovery in the drug production, we can provide sponsors with more drug product and simultaneously reduce the cost of delivering medication to their patients. We previously recorded a video webinar on minimizing drug product loss, but we'll provide a brief overview of this topic here. We'll discuss the typical amount of loss when partnering with the fill finish CDMO and how the CDMO can work to reduce drug product loss. And I'll out outline our low loss filling process at BSM, explaining why it's particularly well suited for interocular products. First, it's important to understand where drug product losses occur and how much is typically lost in the process. Drug product losses typically occur during the filtration and sterile filling processes. In filtration, you'll encounter filter holdup, and the volume loss here depends on factors like inner diameter and length of the tubing between the filters and the size and type of filters used. At a minimum, you can expect to lose approximately 25 milliliters. Additionally, there will be some drug product that remains in the vessel used to prepare the solution and in the tubing, often referred to as transfer loss. This can amount to at least 10 mils of loss. In filling, a line purge is needed to fill the fill needle assembly with drug product and remove air from it to ensure accurate and consistent fill volumes. While this purge can be limited, it typically involves no less than 10 mils of product loss. Another potential source of loss is from destructive weight checks. However, for interocular drug products with their extremely small fill volumes, this loss is often negligible and is a not a significant concern. Finally, at the end of the fill, you'll have transfer loss in the bag you're filling from and the fill lines. You can also expect that there will be some solution left at the end of the fill when air becomes trapped in the line, produces inconsistent fill weights and checks, and therefore ends the fill. Expect at least 10 mils to be lost here if a bio bag is used and at least 100 mils to be lost if a glass vessel is used. So in between filtration and filling, at the very least, you should expect to lose 55 milliliters in the best case scenario. This calculation assumes that we are using the smallest filter sizes, minimal tubing length, and a near total recovery of potential transfer losses. The actual amount of drug product loss will vary based on various factors, including the specific equipment used, product character characteristics, the filling line employed, the contract manufacturing organization, and more. However, as a general guideline, most CMOs typically advise preparing for a loss of about a liter of drug product. To minimize drug product loss, one of the primary areas to focus on is addressing filter holdup and line loss. One strategy is to reduce the length of tubing used. There's a lot of advantages to this strategy. This reduces loss, reduces back pressure, and stress on the system. It does not affect filtration performance and has no sterility concern and is easy to do. Another strategy is to reduce the inner diameter of the tubing. This adjustment doesn't impact filtration performance, but it does contribute to increased back pressure in the system. Careful consideration of the balance between reducing loss and managing back pressure is essential when implementing this approach. With filters, it's important to use the smallest filter surface area possible to cut down on holdup volumes. However, this will increase filtration time and most filters have a limit to what they can filter. 
At Berkshire Stereo Manufacturing, we perform filter studies to determine the most suitable filter membrane and size in order to optimize this filtration process. This ensures we strike the right balance between minimizing product loss and maintaining efficient filtration. Reducing the number of filters, if possible, will also help reduce drug product loss. However, for risk mitigation purposes, many projects typically employ a two-filter setup. Another source of product loss is in the transfer losses. Some amount of drug product will get stuck on the walls of the vessel that the drug product is filtered out of or filled from. Filling from a biobag can help reduce transfer losses because these can be drained completely, whereas filling from a mixing flask can leave about 100 mils or more in the vessel, contributing to losses. Reducing line purge requirements will help limit drug product loss. If it's possible to reduce your line purge from 25 to 5 mils, then this should be written into the batch record. Non-destructive weight checks will save product that could otherwise go to patients. If your CDMO does not offer non-destructive weight checks, then you might consider the option of reducing the frequency of destructive weight checks. This is feasible if your weight checks have been rigorously addressed and determined to be highly consistent and accurate. Instead of checking every 100 vials, maybe you can check every 150 vials filled, for example. If the batch size is small enough, opt for single head filling. Each fill line will have its own fill line assembly that will add to the line loss and require its own weight check. Reducing the fill head from two heads to one will cut these losses in half. Finally, at the end of a fill, your CMO should lift the bulk drug product solution to ensure all product empties the vessel and allows air to flow back into the vessel and away from the pump and fill needle if it happens to get pulled into the filling line. This will ensure weight checks remain consistent at the end of a fill and prevent premature end that could lead to significant drug product losses. Performing an engineering run prior to your GMP run will be essential to understanding your formulation and filling process and identifying areas of improvement to reduce loss and improve quality. If your API is prohibitively expensive or hard to procure, then dunnage may be used and substituted for your API to perform an engineering run. We discuss this among other topics in a webinar recorded on engineering runs for those interested. So in summary, to reduce drug product loss, Reduce the length and ID of the tubing. Use fewer and smaller filters. Fill from a bio bag. Reduce line purge requirements. Perform non-destructive weight checks or fewer destructive weight checks. Use a single head filling and lift the drug product at the end of the fill. We've made considerable strides in minimizing drug product loss for our clients. And I would like to share a quick story to describe how and why we've done this. In one project, we initially had around 300 mils of drug product, and our task was to fill as much as possible. During the first engineering run, we encountered losses of approximately 110 mils, stemming from various factors such as filter holdup, filter flush, tailings, line priming, weight checks, transfer losses, and units that were filled and subsequently subjected to quality testing. While achieving this level of recovery was commendable, especially given the small starting batch size, our client was eager to explore avenues to further reduce product loss. This is when we designed a new filling process with the goal of pushing product loss to its minimal limit. Through this new process, we successfully reduced drug product loss to a remarkable range of just five to 10 mils for each batch. When accounting for filter holdup, the overall loss remains under 30 mils. This achievement was made possible through several key strategizing. We substantially reduced the length of tubing in the process. What used to be four feet of tubing in our other filling lines has been condensed to just six inches or less in this line. We replaced the peristaltic or piston pump with a time over pressure system. In this system, the drug product is first filtered into a pressure vessel. The vessel is then pressurized to a low level, around one or two PSI, and the volume is accurately controlled by a dispense valve. Operators trigger the valve to open for a specific duration using a foot pedal. The dispense volume is controlled by changing the time the valve is open. This new filling process also comes with several additional benefits. All materials are single use. The process provides highly accurate and consistent fill volumes. In studies, we observe weight checks consistently remain within 1% of the set dose, even for a dose as low as 75 microliters. 
This process is easy for operators to use, involves no hand pipetting, and is excellent for very small drug product lots. Unfortunately, this process is limited to vial filling only, but we're working to make this available for syringes soon. Reducing drug product loss can help sponsors supply their patients in a more efficient and cost-effective way, especially for interocular projects where even a few milliliters of loss can greatly impact the number of units filled. Implementing strategies outlined here or adopting our low loss fill process can lead to a substantial reduction in loss, ultimately improving access and supply to patients. Thank you, Tyler. That is the end of today's presentation. In just a moment, we will transition to the Q&A portion of this webinar. Again, to ask a question, select the word bubble that appears in the toolbar at the right-hand side of your screen. An area to type in your question will appear. Go ahead and write us your questions right now. I'm going to give everyone a moment to ask their questions. Uh, today's webinar is the 10th webinar of this series, Sterile Filling 101. All of our previous events are listed here and recordings of these webinars are available on our website or YouTube channel. Okay, looks like we've received all the questions we're going to get. Let's start with that first question. So I'm gonna direct this one to Xu Feng. The question is, how can we determine the most suitable filter membrane and size for optimizing the filtration process? We usually perform a filter study if there's no um, information on what the type of filter membrane or size uh, for use in the process. In the filter study, we can get a VMAX, which is a parameter you define uh, in the study to see how much product can be filtered per certain square meter or square centimeters of the filter membrane um, until the membrane will foul or clog. The other parameters we evaluate in the study are uh, product retention. Some of the filter membrane type may have a, an interaction with the product and may cause loss of the concentration. We also study other parameters that may be crucial for the filtration process, such as um, pressure and uh, filtration rate. Thank you, Xu Feng. Uh, this one will go to Tyler. Tyler, the question asks, how are non-destructive weight checks performed? So non-destructive weight checks are performed in the process of the filling pro process with the low loss filler. And we're actually measuring the volume that's dispensed into the vial a real time, analyzing that data and having the ability to adjust the fill volume within specification. Thank you for answering that. Uh, Xu Feng, are piston pumps or peristaltic pumps better for accuracy? Between those two pumps, typically piston pump offer better precision. Um, in terms of accuracy, that is uh, the target value, both are capable, but piston uh, historically, in, like as a technique, uh, offers better precision. Thank you for that. Uh, this next one's going to Sean. Where do CMOs lose a liter of drug product? In most filling processes, most of the waste or the lost drug product will happen by the number of vessels that are used. Uh, if you transfer from one vessel to another, you always lose product that's left over in the vessel, left over in tubing. Also, a large volume of liquid can be lost in the filtration process. If you're using filters that are too large for the volume to be filtered, you can have a very significant holdup of liquid inside the filter housings. And then finally, the last area where CMOs typically lose a lot of liquid or a lot of product would be in the filling line. If they have a very large filler or the filler requires larger lengths of tubing or large ID tubing, a significant amount of product can be lost there. 
At BSM, we tried to optimize the filling process to minimize the idea of the tubing, make the filters as small as possible to complete the filtration that was required, and use a time pressure filler, which could be located very close to the filling needle to reduce any holdup volume from tubing. Thank you, Sean. Uh, back to Xu Feng. Does the sensitivity of the eye to endotoxin impact the selection of materials? Certainly. Um, as, as we described in the webinar, because the eye is sensitive to the endotoxin, we want to reduce the endotoxin level throughout the process. One crucial piece of this control is through selection of materials. We want to use materials with the lowest level of endotoxin available and uh, from qualified vendors and it was a certificate of analysis showing low level of endotoxins. If such a material or vendor is not available, we have to assess the risk of using such material. Thank you. And then Sean, what do you need to make the low loss process available for syringes? Our low loss filling process was designed specifically in a vial format to begin with, because that's what most clients wanted. Uh, we have been asked if we're able to do syringes, and the answer to that is yes. The only difference we need, uh, the only additional equipment we need would be change parts that would support syringe filling. Thank you for answering that question. We will end there. I want to give a huge thank you to everyone that's watching this webinar now. And a thank you to our speakers, Dr. Sean Kinney, Dr. Shu Fang Sun, and Tyler Rush. Thank you for your input in today's event. I hope you guys took a lot away from this presentation and I hope to see you again in our future webinars.